Welcome back. I am Frank Vignone, President and CEO of Old Salem Museums and Gardens. We are sitting in the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. I'm here with Daniel Ackerman, Chief Curator for the organization. And this episode of Colors and Preservation is about green. The scary thing for me about green is so much of its history has to do with toxic chemicals. <laughs> and bad side effects from the color. But let's start with this room. As we've been doing with the rest of the episodes, you've chosen a room that really we can talk about this color. Absolutely. I mean, green is one of those colors historically that's really hard, which is kind of ironic when you think about it because green is all around yeah. us. I mean, it's probably the single most common color in the natural world. But to actually create the color green in paint, in ink, in ceramics, can actually be very difficult. In this room, we are looking at green applied to the walls probably around 1815 or so in a house in Catawba County, North Carolina. And as you can see, it's not just plain green, but it's green, what we tend to refer to as fancy paint scheme. Fancy painting meaning graining and marbling and different effects. And it becomes really popular in the early 19th century. Uh, and I think that's because by the early 19th century, color and access to color is really becoming democratized through the Industrial Revolution, through scientific advancements. Suddenly the cost to use different colors goes way down. Did it always look like this or like the other rooms we've been talking about in this series? Has it gone through some changes? Well, you know, that's actually really interesting in this room. When it was installed here, the graining was all present, but before the museum opened, we actually hired somebody to come and restore it. And what restoring it meant in the 1960s was basically to look at what survived and paint a whole new scheme on top of it that was meant to replicate the original scheme. But we were lucky. The paints they used were easily able to be separated from what was located underneath. And what we found was that the person who did the work in the 1960s really created a, a very simplified version of it, almost like a caricature of it. They also picked colors and hues that really spoke more to kind of a 1960s idea of what the past looked like than what was actually present. And so we were able to remove their work and, and bring it back roughly to what it was when it first came into the museum in the 1960s. So this is actually the original paint layer. Now to protect it, we went back on with a reversible barrier coat and we chose to go slightly more matte to try to represent to the best of our knowledge, you know, what it would have looked like during the majority of its history. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because in that description are essentially choices. Choices of the curator, uh, choices of the preservationist. I mean, it still has a sheen to it, this wall, but you chose a specific kind of degree of sheen based on a kind of curatorial perspective. That's generally true in any case when you're reproducing historic interiors. Yeah, I think when, when curators make decisions about objects, you know, we have to be very humble. And we have to recognize that the decision we make today may in 20 or 30 or 50 years be determined to not be the right decision. And so one of the, the, the main things about any kind of conservation or restoration work that we undertake at a sort of curatorial level is this idea of reversibility. So everything we did to this, other than removing the 1960s overpaint, can be undone. When we're looking at the pottery pieces on the table here, both of them are using greens. Talk to me a little bit about this plate, if you would. Yeah, this plate's actually really interesting because of its condition. You can actually see how the lead glaze is flaking off of the earthenware body. The potter responsible for making this plate would have used a technique called slip trail decoration, in which they would actually take a particular tool and drip a mixture of clay and water and different elements onto the surface that when exposed to the fire of the kiln would turn color. And so this green color here is generally made using a copper oxide. Copper is one of the great providers of green pigment. And then we have this beautifully glazed pot in front of us that is just a solid green 
glaze. So that is a pot made in the Wythe County, Virginia area. It was really a pottery making region that's known for these sort of jars with these loop handles on them. It's lead glazed earthenware, which we've talked about before. You know, remember these pigments are being ground by hand. You can only be so consistent. You're also firing this in a wood fired kiln. So the heat's not incredibly precise. And those two things combined mean that, you know, rather than getting just a solid green when it fires, you're actually getting this kind of beautifully modeled effect. Let's talk a little bit about where they actually found the color green. As you said early on, green is all around us. You think it would be really easy to get. That's not necessarily true. What colors make green? Yellow and blue. blue. Yeah. And so you have a couple options. If you can't get something that is itself a vivid green color, then you need to mix yellow and blue. Well, as we talked about during the blue episode, blue as a paint pigment really expensive until the introduction of Prussian blue. And then in the early 19th century, there's a new color called chrome yellow. So suddenly you have these two artificial pigments, a really vivid and stable blue and a really vivid and stable yellow. Put them together, you now have this really vivid and stable green, but it's still not that sort of candy apple green, you know, that green green, that grass green that you think about. And so in the 19th centuries, chemists continue to work and develop a number of greens, both for paint pigments and, um, and fabrics. But do you know what they discovered makes a really good green? I'm afraid to ask. Arsenic. <laughs> So on the one hand, the use of arsenic allows for the creation of really, truly beautiful, vivid greens, that kind of electric green that you think of when you think of the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, it's highly deadly. I do think it, that a lot of scholarship is showing us that wallpaper during a certain time period really did use this arsenic-based green. And even though this is not wallpaper, it's marble paper for this little book, but the green is really vibrant. It is, and I suspect that that's not an arsenic green because I think if it were, we'd probably be taking some special precautions. Mm -hmm. You know, people want what is new, people want what is vibrant, and so it's no surprise that when folks have the opportunity to use some of these new cutting edge, vibrant pigments, they go for them. You brought out some images for us um, that obviously used a green-based ink. Talk to us a little bit about this fractor. So this fractor is by an artist who we call the Air Vader artist um, because most often they began their fractor with a decorative lettering saying Air Vader und Mater, honor thy mother and thy father. And this artist worked up and down the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So here you see these really beautiful watercolor greens and blues and reds and yellows. Really vibrant. Really vibrant, but it's telling us among other things, that this piece probably didn't spend a lot of time being exposed directly to sunlight. So in the case of the map, there is a tradition of using watercolor washes to outline and color maps. And so in this case, somebody would have taken the time to carefully outline all the counties and would have chosen the colors, yeah, I'm assuming mostly at random, with the goal being how to use color to most effectively communicate boundaries. One thing that I really enjoy walking through um, the Mesda galleries is that we really have to look beyond just the surface aesthetics of the furniture, of the map, of the fractor, of the pottery, that um, the, the story of color in itself has all of these tentacles to the economy and trade and science and aesthetics. So it's not just a matter of looking at a piece of furniture or looking at this woodwork here. There really is a kind of um, inner narrative that just color itself is telling us. Absolutely, and the colors are telling each other as well because all of these colors are in conversation with one another. Um, which is one of the really fun things about being in a decorative arts museum. You know, none of these things are in a vacuum. They're all part of a complete environment. This is great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us for this episode of Colors in Preservation. Next time you visit us at Old Salem or at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, walk through the galleries, take a special look at the colors. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Frank. Bye-bye.